Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, we thank you for health and strength. We thank you for our provision, protection. We thank you for your wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you, dear Father, that you have given us these awesome truths by which, dear Father, we may truly prosper and be in good health. This evening, O Father, we ask that you will bless our presenter. We ask, O Lord, that you will guide her as she presents her ministry, the information to your people. We ask, O Father, that as those who join us hear the information, that it will not only benefit them, but that they truly, dear Father, will take the information and share it with others so that the message of health can go far and wide. So, Lord, we commit all these things into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another health workshop, the first Sabbath of every month at 5 p.m. Central. And today we have an exciting uh, presenter going on. Uh, we were having a good old time before uh, we started the recording. So for those of you who want to, you know, get in on some of the fun, I urge you to join us live. And um, I also want to give you a, just a glimpse about our speaker. So our presenter this, in, this evening is Michelle Cato Williams, and she has been a servant of God for many years. She has made a determined effort to serve him wherever she is. Uh, Michelle is a physical therapist by profession, and she currently works at Oakwood University, where she teaches in the Health and Human Sciences Department. She also continues to practice in the local hospital. She has been active in church work in many different capacities over the years, and she has a passion for friendship evangelism and for the youth of today. She relocated to Huntsville about 10 years ago with her two children and is grateful for the connections she has made. She wants to share that the most important thing to know about her is that she loves the Lord and longs to see him in peace soon. So one of her favorite verses is Psalms 39, seven. And now Lord, what way I for? My hope is in thee. And she has found God to be a constant in a world of change and uncertainty and her trust is in him. So I invite you this evening to uh, join uh, Michelle as she presents, fighting the four Fs of aging, falls, fear of falling, frailty, and the floor. So Michelle, the forum is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Sister Linda. I appreciate that um, invitation and I, I appreciate the, the invitation to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, yes, I've been a physical therapist for, I stopped counting. I stopped counting after 25, after 20, over 25 years. And most of my practice has been with the geriatric population. I love me some senior citizens. Um, and so I have um, worked with many people, um, dealing with the impact of falling, preventing falls, assessing fall risk, doing home evaluations, and um, helping, helping patients, helping people to get stronger so that they um, avoid another fall or avoid many times when I start working with them, they've already had a fall or two. So, so this presentation is designed is a little different because I, I recognize that I don't have the opportunity to assess anyone. I don't know where you are physically. I don't know your history. I don't know anything about what's going on with each of you. So this is a fairly general presentation and I'll put this disclaimer out there. I'm gonna share some exercises. I'm gonna share some balance um, testing that you can even do at home. Um, but if you are having any problems and you have any questions beyond what this presentation covers, be sure and see your doctor, um, let him know, him or he or her know what's going on with you, and don't be afraid to request a physical therapy evaluation. Um, I tell my patients, don't ask, don't put a question mark on the end of that. Tell your doctor that you would like 
a referral to physical therapy. Here in the state of Alabama, we now have what's called direct access, which means that you can even have an evaluation and a few treatments done by a physical therapist without a doctor's evaluation or without a doctor's order. Um, so you can always go in and be evaluated, but if you want your insurance to pay for it, then you, you know, you gotta go to the doctor and do all that good stuff. All right, so with that disclaimer out, let's um, proceed. Okay, my little falling man. So my goals with this session is to describe some of the causes of falls in older adults, talk about ways that we can decrease our risk of falling, and then go through our home room, room by room and look at some ways that we can make our, our homes safer, especially the older we get, the more important some of these things become. So what is a fall, according to Miriam Webster, it is to descend freely by the force of gravity or to drop oneself to a lower position or to leave a, an upright, upright erect position suddenly and involuntarily. Um, the World Health Organization defines a fall as an event, an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently, unintentionally, accidentally on the floor or the ground or another lower level. So falls are pretty serious. Um, one in four Americans, 65 or older, are at risk of falling. Uh, over 800,000 patients a year are hospitalized from falls, and more than 95% of all hip fractures occur due to a fall. So falls are serious, especially in the older population, 65 and older. The risk is even more prominent, the more risk factors that a person has. If you've fallen before, you're more at risk to have another fall. If you have any balance or gait impairments, which means um, difficulty walking, or if you're on certain kinds of medications and the more medications a person is on, the greater the risk can be for falling. And then here are some of the adverse outcomes or poor outcomes that can happen because of a fall um, and some of the most common ones with age, a hip fracture, uh, traumatic brain injury, the critical fall, the critical fall, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's essentially defined as a fall where someone cannot get up from the floor. Um, and then another risk of a fall is an increased increased risk of being placed in a nursing home facility, okay? All right, so what are some of the risk factors for indoor versus outdoor falls? Indoor falls are more likely to be people of an older age, more likely to be female, and more likely to be in poorer health. Whereas falls outdoors tend to be people who are younger, male, and more physically active. So if I were to talk to anyone about their falls, these are some of the questions that I would ask. Have you ever had a fall? How many falls have you had? Um, were you injured? When was the last time you had a fall? How long ago was it? Um, if it was greater than six or six months ago or a year, I might be less concerned. If it was, if you've been having multiple falls very recently, then I'm more concerned. Um, and then I'm going to ask about the fall, the last fall. What happened? What were the circumstances? Sometimes falls are totally understandable and explainable. Um, and then I'm less concerned um, about those versus um, ones that were based on someone who was unsteady when they were walking or standing. And um, then I'm going to ask, do you worry about falling? Are you concerned about falling? And you'd be surprised what that will tell um, and healthcare professional, somebody who worries about falling. And we'll talk a little bit but more about that. So shoes, shoes and footwear and falls. Um, the kinds of shoes that we wear will can impact and do impact our balance and our risk of slips and trips and falls because it's, it, it impacts the information that our brain gets from our feet and our ankles, the somatosensory feedback, what our feet feel um, is, is translated up through our joints and into the brain. Um, walking indoors barefoot or in socks 
for walking indoors or outdoors in high heel shoes have been shown to increase the risk of falls in older people. And many of us have been used to walking barefoot, um, but it's important the older we get that we ensure that we have proper footwear and that we don't walk um, around in barefoot or in socks because it increases the risk of falling. You know, someone who's a diabetic may have less um, sensation through in their feet and may not feel when they stepped on something that's impacted their skin integrity or causes a sore or a wound. And, you know, that can, can mushroom into a big problem pretty quickly. Um, other characteristics of our shoes that are important is the, the heel collar height, the sole hardness, the, tre the tread, all of those things impact gait and balance. Um, many older people don't wear shoes that are, that are, that don't wear good shoes. Um, and so it impacts our balance and impacts the risk of fall. And so older people should wear shoes that are low heel with firm slip resi resistant soles, both indoors and outdoors, indoors or outdoors. You may not have to, you don't, don't have to wear the same shoes, but your indoor shoes should have low heels, firm slip resistant, slip resistant soles as well. And you want to, um, many of us wear slip on shoes. Um, and if you have strong balance, that's great, no problem. But if you have any balance issues, then you want to make sure that the heel is encapsulated as well. All right, so there are many medications that are li linked to falls, and I just listed these here. I won't go through all of them, uh, but there are many that impact um, our balance, our vestibular balance, and can increase our risk of falling. Some medications can cause what's called orthostatus and can result in a drop in blood pressure, which can make us dizzy, lightheaded, and increase our risk of falling. So truth be told, the causes of falls can be as a result of many different reasons, medical conditions, environmental reasons, sensory impairments, cognitive changes, of course, medications, and then changes in our walking ability and our balance, and can also be caused by env environmental causes. So these are some of the tests that, that physical therapists might use to examine and assess um, a person's balance and stability and standing and sitting. And um, I just listed these all here. I'm not gonna go through all of those. So what are some interventions that we could put in place to decrease the risk of falling? Um, manage blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension is when a person changes position, go from say laying down to sitting to standing and the blood pressure drops. That increases the risk of falling. So I always tell my patients to take your time. Do not rush to get up and to move. Even if you're going to the bathroom, I would rather you have an accident on yourself than fall. So you wanna go from sitting, so from laying down to sitting and sit for a few seconds stand and stand still for a few seconds. Don't rush off um, to make sure that you give your body an opportunity to adjust to the change in position as your blood changes, um, as you change position. Optimal vision, have you had your vision checked recently? Are you wearing the current and uh, up-to-date prescription with your glasses? Address foot problems. Um, as an assistive device might be a walker or a cane. Are you using someone else's device? Has it been adjusted for you? Are you using, um, I've seen people buy um, those wooden canes, those long wooden canes um, that are ornamental and use those as an assistive device and depending on their balance, it may or may not be appropriate for them. But if someone is having, um, health issues, then I would recommend that an assistive device be 
fitted for you and that you are taught how to use it properly. And then of course, home safety, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Medication management is conversations with your doctor and to use, take the medications that you have been ordered and prescribed properly. I've, I've had many patients who don't wanna be on their medications. They don't wanna take them. And so they, they take them inconsistently. And I've seen people manage their blood pressure by taking their blood pressure medication when they think they need them. And, you know, hypertension is called the silent killer for a reason. You can't tell unless you check your blood pressure specifically. And our blood pressure changes and fluctuates throughout the day. Um, and so if you are hypertensive and the doctor's giving you medication, it's important that you um, take it as prescribed and have ongoing conversations with your physician. All right, so when we're talking about a home assessment, um, some of these things are common sense, but some of them are not. Um, sometimes modifications to the home might need to be made. There are times when say a ramp needs to be put in or, or, or can be put in, or sometimes say someone is using a wheelchair and the doorways are too narrow. Um, maybe doorways need to be opened. Um, clear pathways are definitely something that is important to decrease, excuse the noise back behind me. I don't know if you can hear somebody's cutting their lawn behind me. Uh, remove insecure throw rugs, throw rugs, extension cords, install grab bars where needed and approve improved lighting. We'll talk a little bit more as we go through each room here. All right, question. What room of the house do you think most falls occur in? Anybody, anybody? Kitchen. Kitchen, okay, that's one answer. Anybody else? Bathroom. Bathroom, all right, anyone else? The front door. Front door, okay. One more person, anyone else? All right. According to the National Institute on Aging, 80% of senior falls happen in the bathroom, the bathroom, due to slippery floors and surfaces, all right? So let's talk about areas in our home and ways that we can make these areas safer. So starting with floors, stairways, hallways, you wanna make sure that you have handrails. Um, and if you have handrails, make sure they are secure. Hold that handrail when you're going up and down, even when you're carrying something. And if you're carrying something, you don't want to um, allow it to block your view of the steps. Um, you want to make sure that there's good lighting um, with switches at the top and the bottom of the stairs and on both um, um, on each end of a long hallway. Um, consider using motion activated light plugs. Um, there are so many um, devices that we can access now that are inexpensive. Even you can get those, those um, pop-up lights at the Dollar Tree that you can um, install. Um, and even using lights that, that are motion activated so that when you walk by them, you have a lit area. I always recommend that, that in the bathroom, especially there should be um, some type of, what do you call those? Oh, night lights, a night light in the bathroom. Um, seniors should not be walking around their home in pitch black. Um, you wanna keep the areas where you walk tidy. Um, you know, don't leave books or papers or clothes or things on the floor. Um, check to make sure that all your carpet is, is secure so they don't slip. You can use non-slip strips that you can buy at any hardware store to put on tile or wooden floors that give a little extra friction to decrease the fall risk there. Um, don't use small throw rugs or, or areas and don't walk on slippery, newly mopped floors, let them dry. Bathrooms, grab bars near your toilets on both sides, on both the inside and outside of the tub and the shower. It helps to increase your safety, non-skid mats and strips and, and no carpet in the bathroom, but rugs, <laughs> non-slip rugs um, on the surfaces that might get wet. 
And then this says to leave a light on in the bathroom or a nightlight that turns on automatically in the dark. In your bedroom, use night lights, night switches close to your bed. Keep a flashlight close by in case the power goes off and you need to get up. Um, use a landline, keep a landline or well-charged phone close by. In the kitchen, you wanna keep the things that you use most frequently within easy reach. Clean up spills quickly. And this is a big one. Many people um, either continue to cook when cook standing because they don't wanna give up the ability to prepare their own foods when sitting can just increase their safety immensely. You can get a, a high bar stool or, or put the things that you need to prepare at a table so that you can sit um, and that will help to prevent fatigue and loss of balance. Outdoor spaces, if you've got steps, make sure they're not broken or uneven. Again, using non-slip material on out outdoor steps is helpful. Um, keep the lawn or in walkways free of debris. Cons consider installing a grab bar near the front door to provide extra balance when you're locking or unlocking the door. Um, turn on that front porch at night. If you leave during the day, but you expect to come back at night so that when you come back, it's lit. In the winter, if you deal with snow or ice, um, and we can say we deal with that here, maybe not all winter, but at some portion, um, make sure that you treat the outdoor walkways with an ice melt product or sand to make them less slippery. So other living areas, you wanna keep extension cords, electrical cords um, near the walls and away from walking paths, not across the walkway. Um, you wanna arrange your furniture, especially low coffee tables that you might not see if you have something in your hand um, so that they're not in your way. When you walk, you wanna create um, clear walkways. Make sure that your sofas and your chairs are the right height for you to get in easily in and out of. Very, very low sofas and low chairs are harder to stand from than ones that are higher for your particular height. I've seen people take whole couches and put cement blocks underneath them to make them the proper height um, so that someone, say, who's had a, a hip replacement or, or surgery or some type of um, ailment that's impacted their strength and endurance um, so that they can, can get in and out of that sofa easily. So you wanna keep the things that you use most often within easy reach. You don't wanna to have to be trying to reach above your head or squat down at the floor to pick them up. So again, some of this is common sense, but if it was common, Everybody would have it, right? Uh, don't stand on a chair or a table to reach something that's too high. Um, use a reacher or ask for help. Better yet, ask for help. Um, reachers are helpful. They're special grab tools that you can get at Walmart or any medical supply store. You can order, to, order them on Amazon as well, and they can help you um, extend your reach. If you use a step stool, make sure that it is steady and sturdy and that it's wide enough for you to put both of your feet, full feet on the step stool. Um, it's even better if you use one that has a handrail on top. Um, and then if you're able to have someone stand next to you, that just increases your safety as well. Pets, many people have pets. Um, I have found that most homes I've been in that have pets, those pets are very protective and well aware when there are ill family members um, and they're, they can be very, very intuitive, but you still need to um, be aware and um, especially at the initial stages. So if, if, if grandma comes home from the hospital and she's on a walker and she wasn't on a walker when she left, you know, that pet now has to adjust to a household with a walker and you teach them and train them not to run in front of grandma, you know, don't nip around the feet and bark around their, and startle her, which might increase her fall risk. Um, keep a list of emergency numbers in large print near 
um, landline phone. Many of us don't use landlines anymore, but some of us do. Um, you can put them, I've seen people post them in the bathroom, post a list on the bathroom, post it on the refrigerator, multiple places around the home, and then save them under favorites in your phone, your cell phone. So what should someone do if they have had a fall? Of course, call for help. Um, and you need to have a way to call for help. Um, if a senior lives by themselves, I always recommend that they have their cell phone on them at all times. Um, you can set your phone so that you can call 911 with either voice activated or a touch of a button. Um, and then there are emergency alert devices that you can wear around your neck that you can press around your neck or um, yes, like a necklace and just push it and, and you can call for help. And then I'm going to recommend, of course, you know, that you ask your doctor, request from your doctor referral for both physical therapy and occupational therapy. So how can we decrease our risk for falls? Everybody remember this commercial, help a fall and I can't get up. So I'm going to show you um, a few simple balance testing tests that you can do at home, and then a few simple balance exercises. The first is the Romberg test, and the second test is a five, five time sit to stand test. So let's talk about the Romberg test. The first thing you're gonna do is stand with your feet together and your arms cross over your chest. And you're just gonna maintain that position for 60 seconds. And if you can do that without problems, then you're gonna move on to the next level. And the next level is from that same position, close your eyes. So your feet are together, your hands are across your chest. Then close your eyes and hold that for 60 seconds. And if you can do that, then we can move to the next progression. And instead of standing with your feet together side by side, you're gonna move one foot directly in front of the other, like you're standing on a balance beam and see if you can hold that for 60 seconds. All right, so both of those require you to stand as still as possible without holding on to any support service or moving your feet. And if you can do that relatively easy and hold those positions for 60 seconds, you've passed the test. And that means that you have what we call good standing balance, good standing static and dynamic balance. And it increases your risk of recovering if you were to lose your balance or trip that you could recover and not fall and injure yourself. Failing the test means that you weren't able to keep your feet together. You had to move your feet or you had to reach for a surface or you had to catch your balance in any of those positions. And if you fail that test um, or any of these tests, I recommend that you see your doctor and request a referral to physical therapy because um, an initial decrease in balance is easier to manage and improve than waiting until there have been multiple falls and injuries, okay? All right, so the second test is what we call a sit to stand test and you're gonna do this um, five times, all right? And it requires both balance and strength in both of your legs. You're gonna, gonna need a regular chair, like a dining room chair and a stopwatch. You're gonna start by sitting in your chair with your arms crossed over your chest. And then you're gonna stand and sit back down five times in a row. Hands over your chest because I don't want you to use your arms to stand. You need to stand just using your legs. So if you can do that five times, the goal is to do that as fast as you can and to have someone time you, all right? If it takes you more than 15 seconds to stand five times quickly, you're considered um, at a higher risk of falling, all right? And again, if you quote unquote fail either one of these tests, I recommend that you see your healthcare provider. All right, so when to seek help, of course, if you have failed either one of those tests or if you have frequent dizziness or unsteadiness, if you have difficulty doing the normal things that you do typically for yourself, bathing, dressing, grooming, getting your food, um, 
whatever the things that you do that make up your day on a typical basis, if you're finding that you're having more trouble doing those things, it's time to get some help. Um, if you have a history of falls or near falls or almost falls, I saw I saw this lady this week. Um, she'd had a hip replacement and um, in talking with her and her husband, it became clear that she had been falling. She'd been having a lot of falls. And um, I asked them whether or not she'd been evaluated for those falls. And the answer was no. And it, it, it became clear to me that there was more going on with her than just hip arthritis, right? Where she just had a hip replacement. Um, and so talking to a healthcare provider, a healthcare professional is important to help to identify maybe things that you may not have even realized may be an issue. And it's better to identify those things sooner rather than later. All right, so now I'm gonna show you, I think I have three, four simple exercises. All right, four simple exercises. So I've shown you two balance exercises that you can do at home. There are many more, but many of those are best done under supervision, not alone at home by yourself. Uh, some of the components of an effective balance exercise are exercises that isolate muscles on both sides of your body, either left or right or front or back. Um, basically, those um, muscles make up your core and must, uh, exercises that target our leg strength and, of course, like I just said, our core strength. All right, so first one, single leg balance. You're gonna stand at a stable surface like your kitchen sink, kitchen counter, and put one hand, one or two hands on that counter. You can see this, this gentleman has his index fingers. He's balancing himself with his index fingers and he's holding on, raising one foot in the air. And I would have you do that for, I would have you do it as long as you could or 30 seconds, depending on what's going on with you. And then you challenge yourself by taking one hand off. So you're only holding on with one. And then you wanna to get to the point where you can do that without holding on at all, or kind of raising your hand off of the table. So it's there if you need it, but you're not holding on to it, all right? So that's the first exercise, single leg balance. This second one is what's called a modified tree pose. And you can see the, the positioning right here. Your hands are in the praying mantis position and you're standing on one leg. This I would do standing in front of a counter, not standing out in free space like she is here. So that if you do need to hold on to something, um, then you've got something there that you can hold on to. This one is heel to toe walking on a line. So you position yourself on a line. You can you can get some masking tape or you can use um, something you might have at home to, to lay a line down on your floor and you practice walking along that line by putting one foot straight in front of the other. Um, and if it's difficult at times, you might need to put your arms out for additional balance. And the better you get, the more you can bring your arms in towards your your body. And the last one is flamingo stand. This helps to build your hip muscles and stabilize your core. And again, do this while you're standing near a wall or counter so you can steady yourself, okay? And for those of us here in Huntsville, I've included two resources for community-based fall prevention programs, Balance for Life and Steady for Life. And I've included the links here I'm sure um, Sister Linda will provide this recording and I'll make sure she has a PowerPoint as well. So that if you want these resources and these, both of these programs actually have full fall prevention balance programs that are free to the public, that are free to the public. These are great programs. So let's talk a little bit about frailty, frailty. Um, Someone can be frail and not sick. Frail, frailty can exist independent of illness or disease. 
It increases with age. Um, most people who are, um, most people who are in their 90s, you know, I'm saying that, and we all know people who are very, who are up there in age who are not frail. But many of the people that I have worked with <laughs> who are up there in age are frail. Um, and there are conditions or diseases that can mimic and accelerate age-related frailty. Um, you, you'll notice they look weak, person may look thin, look fragile, and aren't able to tolerate some of the normal stressors that we can tolerate. Um, they're prone to falls and fractures, prone to illness, and prone to disability and dependency. How can we prevent frailty? By exercise, by addressing strength and balance um, through nutrition, well-rounded meals, making sure all the macros are included, our carbs, proteins, and healthy fats. And then a comprehensive geriatric assessment includes um, includes regular uh, checkups by the doctor. Um, you know, there are people that I have met who avoid avoid the doctor. The more the older we get, the more important it is that we make those appointments and we keep those appointments and we have our annual assessments that we do the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves and to catch things that can be addressed early before they become, um, before they progress to um, really, really advanced stages. So I'm going to talk about the critical fall next. This is a term that's applied when a person falls and they can't get up. Um, the truth is that lying on the ground for a long time after fall almost doubles the risk of death, even for minor falls. And not being able to get up from falling um, increases the risk for poorer outcomes and increases the risk for dehydration, hypothermia, um, pressure, pressure ulcers. And that last word uh, was supposed to be rhabdomyolysis, which is where the muscles start to, um, to deteriorate rapidly based on some type of injury or event and can impact the kidneys and, and throw, throw a body into kidney failure and just, and it can happen rapidly, rapidly, okay? So it's so important um, to prevent and to stay as strong as we can, do everything that we can to maintain our health and mobility and vitality. Fear of falling, fear of falling can be, can be dangerous because it can lead to a, a cycle of increased falls and adverse um, health outcomes such as increased risk of falling and um, some of the outcomes I realized I repeated that I'll fix that um, and hospitalization and and the sequela that in, that occurs with falls hip fractures TBIs uh, traumatic brain injuries and other injuries when someone is afraid of falling it can cause them to not want to go out and not want to do the things that they used to do that was important to them. It limits their, their desire or willingness to exercise and it starts to even limit their uh, willingness to interact socially. They just wanna sit still because they don't want to fall. I have found that people who have had a fall are, are at greater risk and fear of falling and so that fear of falling keeps them still and they're not moving. And that inactivity can lead to muscle weakness, especially in the hips and spine, which is gonna impact balance and increase the risk of falling. So you can see how it's a cycle, a vicious cycle. It can lead to loss of confidence, can lead to depression and anxiety, social isolation, loss of independence, and a lower quality of life. And so if we have people in our churches who are up in age that we don't see at church anymore, it's important to check on them. Check on them, pull them out as much as we can, go pick them up, take them, bring them out. Uh, research has shown that seniors who 
have a an active church life. It impacts their quality of life. They recover quickly from injury. They recover quicker from surgery, just knowing that they have a church family and that um, someone is thinking about them and praying for them um, impacts their quality of life. It's pretty amazing. I think I said that already. I repeated that. Um, all right. So let's talk about the floor and I'm almost done. It's important that everyone knows how to get up from the floor if you were to have a fall. Many of us do it, can do it um, intuitively. But many people, there are people who can't, who don't know how to get up from the floor and there's not a major injury. So um, what I would direct someone to do if they've fallen and they, um, you know, not an obvious injury would be to roll over on your hands and knees and crawl to a stable surface, a chair, couch, and use that to pull up on. And if you can't do that, then you need to speak with your doctor and request a referral for physical therapy, because that's definitely one of the things that we can do is addressing what we call floor recovery. All right. So in summary, we talked about risk factors for falls. We talked about um, the importance of safety at home and how to address in, uh, safety in each room of our home. We talked about the incidence of falls. We talked about balance assessment. I gave you two easy uh, balance that I thought were fairly safe for you to do at home, balance assessments to determine for yourself whether or not you need to follow up with your doctor regarding balance and asking for a physical therapy referral. And I gave you a few exercises. The two, the two assessments that I gave you two can also be used as exercises and that you can use them and do them over and over um, to increase your stability as well. And we just basically talked about the importance of addressing all four of these, F, these Fs, falls, the fear of falling, frailty, frailty, and floor recovery, floor recovery. So I see that there are a couple questions in the chat. Are they, Sister Wendell? Yes, there are. Um, one question that came when you were talking about uh, the assistive devices. Uh, one question came up, is there a real effective assistance device for quickly aiding and getting up from a bed or a chair or a tub or, and for sitting? There is um, a device that can be used for getting out of the bed. And um, so the answer is yes. I've seen various um, devices employed. I've seen um, Uh, give me a second. I'm going to stop my share. And I can share with you real quick. If my computer will cooperate with me. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, um, while Michelle is pulling that up, I'm going to ask uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but you can also ask them as well. So um, if you have a question, just in case multiple people have questions at the same time, you can, if you're in Zoom, you can raise your hand. If you're on the phone, uh, feel free to just on mute and go for it. And so I'm just letting everybody know the the people on the phone, we'll give them dibs since they can't see that hands are going up, if you will uh, be so kind. Okay. All right, so let me compile a list and I'll share it with you, Linda. Is that okay? Yes. Um, but uh, in short, there there's a device that can be um, placed under a mattress and that has a rail that once you sit up, you can put your hand on that rail and it can help you stand. 
Okay. And then um, someone asked for about a chair. Is that right? Yeah, they're looking for different ways, depending on what they're trying to get up from. So it's um, getting up from a chair or a bed or a tub right. or from sitting. So, so getting up from a chair, then I would recommend sitting in a chair that has handrails. Don't sit in a chair that doesn't have handrails. Um, hand, yeah, arm chair rails so that you can push up from those rails. Um, I have seen people install a pole that's attached to the ceiling to the floor, um, but typically I see that near the bed because that's something that's stable and it's not gonna move. Um, that bed is in that position. Um, and so I would just recommend for chairs, using a chair that has rails. And um, from the tub, there are what's called tub transfer chairs. There are two different kinds. There's some that are designed to sit directly in the tub. And then there's some that extend over the side of the tub. So you sit on it first, and swing around and slip your, then swing your feet into the tub. And those have um, rails as well for you to push up on. So I will give you resources for tub transfer benches um, and sit to stand devices from, for the bed. Okay. Don't miss anything. Okay. And I'll look for a chair as well, but typically I recommend just using a chair. Don't, you know, don't use a bar stool that doesn't have um, armrest or that's too low. Okay. So um, Michelle, sometimes we'll have uh, persons who they've, they had a fall and the fall has led them to need some adjustments but uh, they're feeling a lot better and the doctor tells them that it's that they're free to go back to work. Um, how, what conversation do you think that they should have with the doctor and the employer if going back to work requires some physical adjustments in terms of having rails or anything like that installed? What conversations? Um, so what comes to mind off the bat is one, most bathrooms at places of employment should be ADA compliant, right? So there should be rails in the bathroom or at least the commodes at a higher height. The lower the commode, the harder it is to, to stand from. Um, and then at the desk or where they work permanent, you know, in every employee place of employment is different, mm -hmm. right? Whether someone works in an office or they work in the hospital or they work in manufacturing, every place is unique. So I really can't give a blanket answer, but I will say this, that there are some physical therapists who are, uh, who specialize in assessments at work and um, looking at, the work environment. And even if you don't see a therapist who specializes in that, any therapist can help um, problem solve and talk through. So if it were me and I was working with someone who was getting ready to go back to work and they were concerned, I would ask them about their work environment. I would ask them about their um, their seating environment, what, what are their responsibilities? And then craft a plan based on what they their answers are. Um, so I think that's the best answer I can give without knowing specifics. Oh, that's that's thing. So because where I really got from that is um, connect with your doctor and your physical or occupational therapist so yeah. that you can have those conversations and the two of you can work out a plan that then you'll know how you need to proceed. So exactly. So good. Okay, let's see. I see Janice's question. Okay. So um, it says, as a PT, are there exercises that help to heal herniated disc? There are definite exercises that um, can address the reasons why a person had a herniated disc. 
because they don't happen in a vacuum. There's a reason why. And so what the physical therapist will do is evaluate um, the pain pattern. The pain pattern tells a lot about, um, and, and if they have access to it, looking, looking at the imaging as well, the MRI results, the CT results to know exactly where and what side of the disc that that herniated disc is and what nerves are being impacted where along the spine and then craft and develop a plan based on those results. So yes. And then time. Um, time helps to heal um, with time, soft tissue heals. And um, as long as you are uh, moving, like it's so important to move. Walking is the best exercise for the spine. Um, I can give my testimony if that's okay. Um, 19 years ago, I had, when I had my, my, my second child, my son, um, I was in incredible pain um, during the pregnancy and, and turned out that I had a herniated disc. There was nothing that could be done in terms of medical um, intervention. Um, long story short, I, I knew that I, I, I personally at that time, um, surgery wasn't an option for me. And the Lord just told me once, once he was, once I delivered and I was home and I could do nothing. I could barely get out of the bed. He said, get up and walk. I was like, but, but can I walk? They get up and walk and it took weeks, but the more I walked, the more I was able to walk and, and walking helped my body to recover and to heal. Um, so, you know, physical therapy again is, um, can be critical in helping to address the deficiencies and pain that can result from a herniated disc. So may may I say something? I was I guess I was trying to um so you say there's exercises and things that it help, but is it something that would actually take it away, like put the disc back where they're supposed to be? Uh theoretically there are some exercises. Yes. I have I have seen um now I'm gonna put my cousin on the spot because she's also a physical therapist. Okay. Kellyanne, help me answer this question. Uh, but um I I know that theoretically the answer is yes. Um sure, I'll jump in. <laughs> so from my practice, I have seen persons use a te technique. So you have specific techniques, you have some manual therapy techniques, you have Mackenzie exercises. Um different techniques that we apply and we, we have, you, you can see results in your patients, aquatic therapy. And we yeah. found that um, aquatic therapy does wonders because it, will, it, it takes the weight of the area and allows you to do the exercises to strengthen the core muscles that you need to be strengthened yeah. to support the Gravity the limiting, yes. Right. However, what the problem tends to be is our life. So we sit we bend in incorrectly. So yes, you come to physio, we work wonders and you're feeling better. You go home, you do exercises for a period of time and you're feeling better. But you go back to the same bad practices, bad bending, sitting for extremely long periods because our lives are very sedentary and the symptoms will come back. Um, so it, it, it is a mixture of, are you able to maintain the practices that we have taught you? Um, I've seen persons who are able to do that, you know, keep their exercise up, less likely to come back with a repeat um, incident of predated digs, low back pain, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that she's um, had more, more experience professionally with, with back pain. I'm more mm -hmm. inpatient in home health. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, do I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm in water therapy right now still and PT. But I was just wondering because they switch, like they do the water, then they do PT, but I'm in the PT, but it hurts me so much. 
And I just wanted to make sure that this is going to help me and not make matters worse. All right. I'd be happy to talk to you outside of this. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so one of the questions that has come up is you were talking about how people need to learn how to and bend. So Sorry? You're leading to the additional question. Are you hearing me? Now we are. Can you start again? I think it's your connection. Oh, has to be taken into consideration. You know? Hello? Um, Hello? Kellyanne, Kellyanne, if you can hear us, I think your connection is going in and out. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yes. Okay. I was saying it, it also has to be done in, in collaboration with your physician. It depends also because sometimes the disc is not just herniated, but it has broken off and is sitting in the space. Um, Things like that ha we have to take into consideration. And that's why Michelle said earlier, um, the imaging is also important. And that will determine, you know, success rate um, depends on how bad the herniation is. Um, so the, all the factors have to be taken into consideration, not just, okay, it's herniating and we're doing exercise. There could be other issues that's resulting in not improving. And if you've been doing it for a period of time with no improvement, um, you may need to go back to your physician um, for an, a reassessment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, one of the other things that has come up when you said people sometimes need to learn how to bend properly and do some other things. Is there a class that people can take that will help them to learn how to correctly bend, how to correctly sit, how to even correctly walk? I, I saw a video years ago about, um, uh, an athlete who actually had to learn how to run again because um, they were talking about where your feet land so that you don't, that you reduce injury. So is there like a, a class or, or a resource where you can learn how to do all of those things properly? So the two resources that I've shared um, would can include those um, those elements in terms of standing properly, bending properly, back uh, safety, how to lift properly. Um, but for for the gen and those classes are designed and geared to senior citizens. But for for the rest of us, um, if we wanted to, I guess the answer is it depends on where you are and what resources are are in your town. Um, but asking your doctor is a good a good resource to ask, and um, asking your physical therapist as well is a good resource. Um, learning how to transfer safely, lift safely, how to stand late safely is. How did you do that? Um is critical and can help to protect our spine and help to protect our back, um, especially lifting properly. Um, if our if, if a disc is damaged or close to herniating, we can trigger an event if we are lifting poorly. And lifting poorly meaning um, we're trying to reach way across to pick up something heavy, we should always bring um, pick up something that's from a, a position closer to you versus farther away. Um, if that's something that you you want to do, I you know I can do that as well um, at a later date. Definitely would not take, it's definitely not as involved as this. <laughs> okay. as this book. Yeah, I, I have the bad habit. Uh, um, you're in the car and you didn't get something before you got in the car and then you're reaching around um, trying to pull something that has weight to it from Heavy, the yeah. back and yeah. end up hurting something and all of that. All the bad habits that you go like, oh, I can handle it. And you don't realize the damage it's causing. Right. Until something snaps. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, are there any other questions? We are in our final eight minutes of the session. So if you have any other questions, feel free to unmute and ask them now or type them into chat if you are vocal shy. And we'll be more than happy to get those questions out. Um, remember, there's no such question as a silly question. You never know, your question might be so helpful to someone else who will view this recording at a later time. I just want to say thank you, Linda. I appreciate you for your hard work. And thank you for having uh, Dr. Williams on. I appreciate you guys so much. Praise it be. Praise it be. We're just happy that um, Dr. Williams was able to come on and give her expertise. I'm happy to be here. Thank you all for having me. Galaxy S21, it looks as if you wanted to ask a question. Maybe not. <laughs> um, one of the other things that has come up recently as I'm talking to, to people and you mentioned it about people who have a fear of falling mm -hmm. is that they don't want to get out and do things. Um, what, are, what are some of the ways that we can kind of like encourage them other than going places with them or, or is it like, try to do some stuff close to home and then intro or, you know, what are some of the things that we can do, uh, especially older people are more stubborn about what they will and will not do. Are you talking about someone who hasn't, doesn't have a history of falling? No, they've fallen. They've okay. had at least one fall and now it's like they're, they're scared of yeah. moving around much because they they're thinking they're going to fall. So I would address their strength and stability because the fear is real. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, um, and they can feel internally that they're not as strong as they used to be. Um, and, and I've also seen people who are afraid of, of um, falling, but they don't want to use an assistive device. So they, they insist on walking around without a cane or walker when that cane or walker would make them safer. Um, and so, you know, someone like that would benefit from a course of physical therapy. Um, but someone who uh, I just came back from um, visiting with um, an elderly person out of town who hadn't lived, left her house in several days, and she's just becoming more and more comfortable at home. She hasn't had any falls, but she's less and less interested in getting out because she's um, self-isolating. And um, I encouraged her and, and just talked to her about the importance of getting, it's, there's just something about getting dressed, getting up, getting out, you know, and getting her out. She came back home. She slept so much better that day because she did more walking than she would have had she been at home. Um, it's just, it's so important that we check on our, our loved ones who are at risk for self-isolating and encourage them, you know, what, what would it take? Do they have a, is there, you know, some grandchildren in their lives, bring them over, you know, step outside of our comfort zone and what's convenient for us to, to be of help. Yeah. You've, you've given us a task of being more vigilant about our community mm -hmm. to make sure that we, we try to understand maybe why they do what they do and be able to be supportive rather than just shrugging it off. Yeah. I mean, you can't make anyone do anything. We all have agency and power of choice, but sometimes the isolation um, just makes it harder and just being around other people gives them something to look forward to, you know, make an appointment, let's, let's go out to eat, or I'm going to come and pick you up and, or just visit with them, it makes them more open to doing more the next time. Mm -hmm. Amen. Our audience is quite uh, quiet this evening. 
So um, this is a wrap up, a kind of a wrap up question. Uh, and this is kind of not exactly connected to this presentation, but could you explain exactly what a physical therapist does? Because I, I don't think that, um, you know, everyone sometimes understands what a physical therapist actually does. So what is the role of a physical therapist? So in short, a physical therapist is a movement specialist. We specialize in, we, we have to have full understanding of all the bones, all the muscles, the ligaments and tendons, how they all work together and how to restore function and movement and strength when they are lost. We can work in many different settings. So, you know, my setting is different from Kellyanne's setting. It might be different from another setting. So we can work in hospitals, nursing homes, school settings, outpatient settings. Many physical therapists specialize in specific um, treatment, uh, specific patients, um, um, settings, no settings, not the word, types, patient types. So some patient, some therapists specialize in pediatrics, working with children, some specialize in orthopedics, working with um, patients who've had injuries to their bones, um, bones and joints, some specialize in geriatrics, some specialize in women's health. And I wanted to say this, speaking of women's health, um, that another factor that can impact isolation for elderly people is um, weak bladders or um, what we call incontinence, that they are less willing to go out because they're afraid of having an accident and they don't drink enough water because they don't want to have an accident, um, which causes you know, medical issues long, long term. Um, and so that's another um, issue that can be addressed by physical therapy and uh, worthy of a conversation with their doctor. Um, so we work in different settings. We work with different patient um, profiles and can be helpful from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> Uh -oh. We have mm -hmm. another question that came in and the question is how different are physical therapists from going to fitness therapists? So a personal trainer or a fitness therapist are very good at strengthening muscles and they work with, they work primarily with people who don't have movement disorders, who are not ill. Um, and a physical therapist is more trained to notice nuance and evaluate balance and strength and balance and and endurance, and they're going to ask questions about functional mobility and design a program that is tailored to address the specific deficiencies of a particular patient, of each patient. Um, a fitness therapist or a personal trainer or, pers or coach, they are designed to build muscle and strength, and they're going to work really, really hard and fast. Um, I work with a personal trainer, and it's interesting watching him work with us versus how I would work with the patient. You know, very intense, um, very focused on strength building, heavy weights. Um, they don't necessarily evaluate the patient first, the person first, whereas a physical therapist is gonna, we're gonna put our hands on you, we're gonna evaluate um, muscle strength, evaluate range of motion, evaluate balance, evaluate how well you're able to move from one surface to another, um, just far more detailed and targeted, if that makes sense. Both are vital, both are important. You know, you wouldn't expect someone who's just had a stroke or Parkinson's disease or um, recovering from open heart surgery to go to a personal trainer. They would say, you need to work with a physical therapist first. And when you have improved to a certain point, you know, then come back to me. Is that helpful? Okay. Uh, Galaxy to S21, was that helpful? All right, you're welcome. <laughs> you're amen, welcome. amen. Okay, well, we've reached the end. So thank you so much for your time, your attention, uh, your questions. Uh, I ask you in joining me and giving 
the virtual hand claps and everything to our presenter, Michelle Cato Williams. And I trust that uh, if you have further questions that come up, that now you have avenues. Uh, Michelle, is yes. there a way that they can reach you um, if they need to? Yes. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. If you do email me, please put in the subject line. Uh, hold on. <clears throat> my eyes are telling on my age. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Now I can see. Um, please put in the subject line that you have a question from our um, health talk about falls and also that I'll, because, you know, we all get... A lot Maybe of email. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Michelle has put her email in the chat. And, and also, if you have multiple questions, I ask you to put them all in one email um, because it will make it easier uh, to go through the emails. Uh, but once again, thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing with us the information this evening. And we hope that we will have you uh, back again to do another session for us. I We have oh, one person already who has said that they will definitely be reaching out to you uh, for some help. Okay. So um, let us have a word of prayer and, and then we'll wrap up. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for using Michelle this evening to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge to help us gain understanding about how, dear Father, we may truly take care of the bodies that you've blessed us with, that we can truly honor the temple, and that we, dear Father, are able to go and help others, to fellowship with others by truly looking out for the well-being of our fellow man. May these tools that we've been given, this information that we've been given, May we, dear Father, use it and use it in love, recognizing that each person has to make their decision and we are there to support and to encourage. So, Lord, uh, we praise you for the opportunity to be used. And, Lord, please bless Michelle in a special, special way. Mm -hmm. For, Lord, she is doing your work. And we ask, dear Father, that you will bless her and her family and that the work she's doing will go far and wide. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Have a wonderful evening and God bless.